been to talks that I've given before know that I like talking about women, especially women who've made their way in a hostile world. It was very hard for clever ladies, especially those with no money in Georgian times. And today I'm going to talk about Dorothea Jordan, an actress, someone I really admire and who ha was the most generous of people and who, by dint of her prodigious talent, reached dizzy heights despite being poor until everything went wrong. We've got a marvelous picture of her as Viola in Twelfth Night. Um, it was painted by John Hopner when she was an established actress and her fame was increasing. Neither John Hopner nor Dorothea had a drop of royal blood, but they both had very strong royal connections. John Hopner, who lived from 1758 to 1810, was a well-known and highly respected portraitist who was active a little later than those two titans of portraiture, Gainsborough and Reynolds. Here's a self-portrait painted in 1800 when he was in his mid-40s. He was born in Whitechapel, the son of German immigrants. His mother served as an attendant to Queen Charlotte, <clears throat> wife of George III. And as such, he was able to mix with his, their 15 children. He spent time at court when he was a child. He sang beautifully and sang in the choir, and he was identified as a talented artist. King George gave him a bursary that enabled him to study at the Royal Academy, where he did very well. This fatherly interest and financial report by the king, support by the king, led to unfounded rumors that Hopner was the king's illegitimate son. I can find absolutely nothing to substantiate this, but I do know that George did encourage young people. He first exhibited in the Royal Academy in 1780 and became a Royal Academician in 1795. He liked doing landscapes, but was best known for his pictures of women and children. Uh, he, was, he was appointed official portraitist to George IV in 1794. After the death of Gainsborough and Reynolds, Hopner and Thomas Lawrence took over as the leading portraitists in England. I don't know why they're no longer as popular as they were because they're both fantastic artists. This led to many commissions to paint portraits of important figures in society in England, concentrating on women who were well born, who had achieved fame in other ways. This included Mrs. Jordan, the subject of this portrait. He did two more portraits of Mrs. Jordan, the comic muse, probably acquired by William IV, who wanted all pictures of Mrs. Jordan. It's in the Royal Collection. And Hippolyta, from To Have and Have Not, uh, a long forgotten play by Collie Sibber, which is in the National Portrait Gallery. Dorothy was born in 1761 to Francis Bland and Grace Bland, and she was christened Dorothy, known as Dolly. Francis Bland had abandoned his family when Dolly was 14, leaving Grace to bring up six children. They needed money, so Dolly started work in a milliner's shop. But her mother thought that she had talent and encouraged her to become an actress known as Dolly Bland. She, her first job was at the Crow Street Theatre in Dublin, owned by Thomas Ryder, where she became a great success. As you can see, she was not a great beauty, but she was tall and shapely, with lovely legs suited for the trouser rolls, where women masquerade as boys. She had comic talents and she sang. Not surprisingly, she caught the eye of an ambitious young actor-manager, Richard Daly, who invested in a theatre as a rival to the Crow Street Theatre. He named it the Theatre Royal Dublin and offered Jolly, Dolly a position. She knew there'd be insufficient trade for two theatres to survive, so despite feeling loyalty to Ryder, she joined the Theatre Royal in 1781. But I am sorry to say that Daly had more than Dolly's acting skills in mind, for she was a good religious virgin and she rebuffed him. His punishment was that her roles got worse, but Daly lived in hopes that she would succumb. When Dolly's sister was ill, Daly offered to lend her money for medical treatment. 
After she'd struggled to pay it back out of her salary and expressed great relief that she owed him nothing, he pointed out, aha, what about the interest? You don't think I was going to give you that money without any interest? And unless you pay me now, you'll go to debtor's prison. Not a nice place. He said she could avoid debtor's prison if she gave herself to him. He gave her no option but to have sex with him as the alternative to incarnation. She hated him. She was disgusted by him. But she never thought that she could escape as Daly kept a constant watch on her. If she ever tried to escape his attentions, he held the threat of debtor's prison over her. He was sexually abusive in the most horrible way and constantly demanded to know her whereabouts and he expected her to jump whenever she sent for him. She found herself pregnant in 1782 and was consumed with shame and fear and she found her situation intolerable. So despite the pregnancy, she felt she must escape England, to England. She, her mother, sister and brother had to disappear in the middle of the night to avoid daily finding out. A, a, an actress's costumes are the tools of her trade, but Dolly had to leave them all behind to avoid to daily being alerted. They took a boat from Dublin across the Irish Sea to Liverpool in 1782. Grace knew a theatre manager called Tate Wilkinson, who had a company in Leeds where she hoped Dolly could work. They had no money, so it had, they had to walk. It took them a month to walk the 100 miles from Liverpool to Leeds so that her mother could persuade Tate Wilkinson to take Dolly on as an actress with comic talents. Here's Tate Wilkinson. He agreed to see them. <clears throat> Imagine the scene. Dolly had no clothes other than the ones she was wearing and they were travel weary and travel worn. She was clearly pregnant, but there was no sign of a husband. He could also see that she had a number of dependents, even discounting the baby. <clears throat> Worst of all, he couldn't see any sign of her comic talent, but being a kind man, he asked Dolly to speak a few lines. He was enchanted and offered her a job at 15 shillings a week. She was advised to be known as Mrs. rather than Miss. She then had to think of a name by which she would be known professionally. She likened their flight from Dublin to Liverpool across the Irish Sea to escape daily to the flight of the Israelites across the River Jordan to escape the wicked Pharaoh. As a result, Dorothea Jordan was born and I will call her Dorothea from now on. <clears throat> In 1782, Dorothea gave birth to a daughter called Fanny, who she loved dearly, despite the circumstances of her conception and the identity of her father. Dorothea spent three years with Tate Wilkinson. Her fame spread, and in 1785, a theatrical scout offered her four pounds a week from Richard Brinsley Sheridan, the writer and owner of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. Wilkinson was upset, but not surprised. She was talented and she felt the draw of the city. He let her go with her, his blessing. And here's a playbill from her last performance in the Beau Stratagem, where she played Mrs. Sullen. Here's her new boss, Richard Brinsley Sheridan. She went off to London to join him, age 23, with her family of three generations. And she started working at the Drury Lane Theatre where reputations could be made or broken. Dorothea's first performance was as the country girl. Here's the playbill. You can't see it very well, but she's playing Miss Peggy. And here's a painting of her by George Romney as Peggy, the country girl. She had a fantastic press and was a great hit with the public and soon became a star. She performed a number of trouser roles. Of course, Twelfth Night, um, as Viola, and then as The Plain Dealer by Witcherly, and Sir Harry Wildair in The Constant Couple. Sarah Siddons was also appearing at Drury Lane at the same time. She excelled in tragic roles and Dorothea in the comic. They were known as The Tragic Muse by Reynolds and The Comic Muse by John Hockner. By this time, Dorothea had met and fallen in love with Richard Ford, a handsome lawyer with ambitions to become an MP, and she hoped they would marry. 
They moved in together with Fanny and Dorothea's mother and sister. But Richard kept putting off marriage on the grounds of his family's disapproval. He had absolutely no objection to living off her earnings. <clears throat> she was busy at the theatre where she remained a great hit. She was pregnant but still carried on playing Rosalind in As You Like It, which was one of her most popular roles. She continued to work hard and her pregnancy didn't stop her. She and Richard took her house in Petersham, paid for by Dolly, a fashionable retreat within easy reach of London. And in August 1787, she had a baby, another girl called Dora. But in September, she was back on the stage in London, playing Hippolyta by John Hopner, who painted her in that role. Her second child with Ford, a boy, died shortly after he was born. She went north on, on tour in the summer of 1789. Dorothea was pregnant again, and whilst in Edinburgh, her mother, who'd accompanied her, became unwell and died very quickly. Dorothea was distraught, having lost her friend and support, but being a trooper, finished the tour. After she came back to London, she gave birth to another girl, Lucy, and Richard Ford won a seat in Parliament, representing East Grinstead. So there were reasons for both sorrow and happiness. Dorothea was now supporting Richard Ford's lifestyle, as well as three children, her sister and her brother. She had to work, but she was in her 20s at the summit of her career. She could earn well and expect at least another 10 years of fame. She had three much-loved daughters and they lived in a desirable area of Fulham. Ford had achieved his ambition of getting into Parliament. A happy ending for all. But was it? Dorothea was established as Ford's partner in supporting him financially and in every other way. But despite Dorothea's hopes, he had no intention of marrying her. Marriage to an actress, however famous, could have harmed his political career. <clears throat> At this time, Prince William, third son of the King and Queen, had seen Dorothea act and had his eye on her. When he was 14, he was sent to join the Navy, but I'm afraid he did not excel, and returned to England in 1788 when the King had his first bout of madness. The King, when he recovered, realised he had to do something about William, so he made him Duke of Clarence and gave him 12,000 pounds per annum and rooms in St. James's Palace. William must have had serious intentions about Dorothea, whose country house was in Petersham, as he purchased Petersham Hall Lodge nearby in 1790. Dorothea maintained she did nothing to encourage William, but was using his infatuation as a lever to persuade Ford to marry her. So in 1790, Dorothea asked Richard Ford to definitely say whether or not he would marry her. You must remember that Dorothea had not only been supporting him, but introduced him to levels of society he'd never dreamt of. Despite all she'd done, Ford would not agree to marry her, and they separated. William stepped in. As a result, poor Dorothea was faced with a storm of abuse, the like of which she'd never experienced and was not expecting. She was savaged in cartoons, showing her in a very poor light. It was very unfortunate that the slang for a chamber pot was a Jordan. There's a couple of rather nasty cartoons showing Dorothea and uh, William in the most uh, unpleasant situation. She was famous and William was indiscreet. The public saw that another of the king's son was following in the footsteps of the Prince of Wales, who'd entered into a morganatic marriage with Mrs. His Fitzherbert, who'd been married twice before and was a Catholic. Crookshank produced a famous caricature in a British museum called The Pot Caught It Calling the Kettle Black, showing Dorothea and Mrs. Fitzherbert with the Prince of Wales sitting down looking rather chubby and William looking on, in which Mrs. Fitzherbert tries to pretend she is superior because she's with the Prince of Wales, whilst Dorothy is only with a mere duke. <clears throat> there was some sympathy for Richard Ford having lost his mistress, but to me his only loss appears to be a source of income. He never wanted to make an honest woman out of Dorothea, 
only to sponge off her. She transferred her savings to her sister and Richard Ford for the maintenance of her children, including Fanny. Poor Dorothea, she spent all her life supporting people. There was no doubt that William was deeply in love with Dorothea and wanted to protect her. He was kind to her daughters and proud of her achievements. He was longing for warmth, a family and a home life and Dorothea could provide all these. <clears throat> we do not know if Dorothea had hopes of becoming the Duchess of Sussex, I very much doubt it. But there was no question of marriage because of the restrictions of the Royal Marriages Act. No descendant of George II could marry without the permission of the King. Dorothea was an actress, she was illegitimate, <clears throat> she had no royal blood and was unsuitable on every level as a bride for a prince. Despite this, Dorothea and William had an open and socially acceptable friendship. William and Dorothea's first child was born in 1794, a boy, George. A year later came Sophia. Dorothy had returned to the stage between the two births. She went on with, with William to have 10 surviving children, despite a number of miscarriages, the last child being born in 1807. All the children had the surname Fitzclarence to show that they were the illegitimate children of a member of the royal family. She was a real trooper and worked through all her many pregnancies, on one occasion playing a very pregnant Ophelia. The king showed that he approved of the way William was living a domestic life with Dorothea by putting Bushy Park, part of the Hampton Court estate at their disposal. There was a large house in a thousand acres of park, two hours coach drive from London. There it is, it's now a conference centre. It was a fine home, fit for a duchess, and came with a position as ranger of Bushy Park. It meant very little, but gave William a job of sorts. Her other children and sister lived by, nearby. Dorothea was living a happy domestic life, as well as starring in the theatre, pregnant or not. There's a lovely cartoon by James Gilroy um, showing William pulling a large cram with three children. If you can see, it's decorated with a chamber pot and a crown above it. And uh, Dorothea is walking beside William, looking at what I imagine is a script. She's depicted as the worker, with William being left to pull the children and being subjected to a whipping from his eldest but infant son. It's called La Promenade en Famille. Dorothea was a kind and generous person and interspersed with her appearances for money, she performed benefits for people who had fallen on hard times, giving her services for free, any profit going to the deserving cause. William was doing nothing while Dorothea's career prospered. He was always short of money and relied on Dorothea, who was the wage earner supporting their large family. Gilroy was not wrong. Once William and Dorothy had settled at Bushy, there was an acceptance of the family by the king. The king had fathered 15 children, but at that time had only one legitimate grandchild, Princess Charlotte, the daughter of the Prince of Wales. William had only, was the only one who'd come close to his father's productivity in a baby area, and he was living the kind of domestic, life admired by the king. Dorothea was welcomed in royal circles with her children. Uh, they moved to Bushy Park and more babies followed with alarming regularity, each baby resulting in Dorothea being unable to work for some time. All the babies were born during the busy winter season, which was a major inconvenience for both Sheridan and Dorothea as they depended on the income. However, despite her frequent pregnancies, she performed several times a week, including a number of performances for charity. She sang as well as acted and even started composing. Two of her songs was published in 1800, one being the Bluebells of Scotland, where Dorothea composed music to accompany an old ballad. It is still sung today. She often played it accompanying herself on a lute or the Theorbo. Here's a picture of her by John Russell playing the Theorbo, which was like a lute, but very difficult because it had a huge number of 
strings. And she was advertised as playing, singing the Blackbird, the Bluebells of Scotland. They were happy, but there was a problem, namely Dorothea's absences from Bushy Park to be on the stage. This meant she was subject of favoured adulation, while William had no career and nothing more than being the third, think, king's third son with no real prospects. Maybe this was why in 1805, William asked Dorothea to give up the stage and devote herself to the family. Uh, it's an odd request, as Dorothea was the wage earner, and it may be an indication of William's lack of self-confidence and jealousy of Dorothea's success. She stayed at home for a year and a half, during which time, inevitably, she became pregnant again. Her eldest daughters with Daly and Ford were of a marriageable age and Dorothea promised the dowries of £10,000 each. This sum attracted Thomas Allsop and Frederick March, two young men with ideas above the station who married Dora, Fanny and Dora respectively, drawn by the large dowries. And as a result of their marriages to the children of the famous Dorothea Jordan, they were able to move in high society circles and spent well beyond their means. Gambling, drink and drugs. Credit was easily obtainable. Needless to say, they turned to Dorothea for money. Dorothea and William were living the high life in Bushy as well. Money was short and Dorothea agreed to return to the theatre world in 1807 with William's very grudging consent. Dorothea opened the season. A member of the audience wrote that she was terribly large, hardly surprising after 13 children. However, her acting ability was undimmed. The Theatre Royal burnt down in 1809 and they had to move to other theatres and go on tour, with Dorothea always generous, giving benefits for stagehands and workers who'd lost their positions. William became churlish and opposed Dorothea working in different theatres and touring. He seemed to ignore their pressing need for money. She'd earned a lot of money for 20 years, spent copiously, shown generosity and saved for her three eldest daughters. She was now approaching 50, no longer slim. She was still bright eyed and seductive when she chose. She still received glowing comments on her comic talents. And on top of that, she was a really nice worst person who always considered other people, mainly those less considerate and fortunate than herself. In her professional life, she commanded respect and was confident, but in her personal life, she was less so. In 1809, all the family were at home at Bushy and happy, but Dorothea had to get on the road again very soon after Christmas. William was not happy about this, but they needed money, partly to help her daughters, but largely to support the Fitzclarence lifestyle. George III was extremely tight with money for his sons, and William made a negligible contribution to the family finances, relying on Dorothea. She'd always earned a lot and spent a lot. She was generous to a fault. William had no business sense. She had to work, but I have a feeling that she thoroughly enjoyed the fame and adulation, although she missed her family. Things were not going well between Dorothy and William by 1810. At the same time, there were problems in the royal family. King George was ill and slipping into madness again. One of his sisters was dying. William spent a lot of time with the royal family at a difficult time for them and started being out to being out invited to elegant functions with his daughter Sophia accompanying him rather than Dorothea. Dorothea in typical generous fashion realized that if her children were to take their rightful place in society they have she had to let them go without her. By Christmas tensions were showing between Dorothea and William. She was no longer the shining star that she'd been. King Ju the Prince of Wales was appointed regent after King George had a really bad bout of madness. Here's the Prince Regent. He gave a huge party to celebrate, and you won't believe this, but Dorothea was not invited, even though there were 2,000 guests. The royal family were beginning to sideline her. 
A once famous actress losing her looks and fame was a nuisance, especially with a lot of healthy, illegitimate children running around. William was contemplating his future. She and Dorothea, he and Dorothea had been together for 20 years. They had 10 children. They were fond of each other. They loved their children, but there were tensions because of their difference in status and Dorothea's constant working. Her reduced income didn't help. She was due back at Dushy Bushy Park in October 1810, but William suggested they meet in a neutral place. She guessed what the summons signified and they parted. William abandoned Dorothea as due to her loss of position as number one actress, her spreading hips, and probably most of all her ability, inability to earn as she had in the past. There was a lot of wrangling and Dorothy was at a huge disadvantage because William had the strength of royalty behind him and an advisor, John Barton, who wanted to get rid of Dorothy as cheaply as possible. Eventually a settlement was reached where Dorothy was given money to support four of her daughters and her younger sons till they went to school. Sophia remained with William. It also provided, if the said Dora Jordan shall perform or act on the stage of any public or private theatre, or shall marry, or shall form any other engagement or connection, which in the opinion of the Duke may be unfavourable to the morals, manners or habits of the said children, she'd lose most of her income. I've never understood why after 20 years of benefiting from Dorothea's earnings, William should suddenly decide that acting made her an unsuitable guardian. After they separated, Dorothea was paid nothing of her proposed allowance. William wouldn't respond, and in desperation she wrote to the Prince Regent and other Dukes asking for help. They all ignored her. Things were difficult for Dorothea. William was in debt and he was unable to pay Dorothea what he owed her. She took a house at 30 Cadogan Place. It has a plaque on it showing that she did live there. Uh, and William delivered the children there and he left them at the back door so he didn't have to see Dorothea. Money was short. One of the biggest drains on her resources was bailing out Fanny's husband, Frederick Orsop. Their situation got so desperate that William arranged for him to travel to India to seek his fortune, but Fanny didn't go with him. She became an actress and eventually killed herself in 1826. The children were finding life in London difficult after the freedom of Bushy, so Dorothea decided it was best for them to go there. She explained to John Barton <clears throat> that she was losing the bulk of her income by returning the children and she couldn't manage. William wasn't paying her anyway. He just ignored her. She had to find work. She was no longer the beautiful <clears throat> ingenue, but a rather stout lady of 50. She decided to go touring as she had so many times in the past, accompanied by Miss Sketchley, who'd been with the family for many years as a nanny governess. She frequently wrote fondly to the children. William was in debt and appealed to Parliament to help. Dorothea gave the children what she could, but there were constant demands on her from her two eldest daughters and their husbands. Dora's husband, <clears throat> Frederick March, for whom Dorothea had some affection, persuaded Dorothea to allow him to draw funds on her bank account, a typical generous action from Dorothea, but a very serious mistake. In 1815, she learned that March had been drawing freely on her account at Coots and also borrowing large sums of money in her name, signing documents as Dorothea Jordan, and he had huge debts all in her name. Someone she trusted had betrayed her. She was facing arrest and debtor's prison for unpaid bills, none of which were hers. She appealed to John Barden to help her, but John Barton didn't even tell William that she needed help. And even if he had, William wouldn't have had the ability or desire. William, the royal family and the advisors were happy to see the back of her. She expected help, but none was forthcoming. She flew, fled to France in the summer of 1815 with the faithful, faithful Miss Checkley, Sketchley, to escape her predators. She rented a modest cottage under an assumed name in saint Cloud the suburb of Paris. She'd said in difficult times in England, sadly, I begin to feel that acting keeps me alive. 
In fact, it keeps you from thinking. She had nothing to keep her alive or to stop her thinking now. She had hoped that Barton would make Frederick March give details of his creditors and make some proposal for payment. Nothing was happening. March was delighted that he could not be pursued as the debt were in Dorothea's name. The family, royal family were delighted that Dorothea was out of the picture and no longer an embarrassment. Dorothea never let her children know how difficult things were her and they do not appear to have had contact with her. She was alone and very poor. She died on the 5th of July, 1816, at the age of 54. She was buried in the cemetery at saint Clou. None of her family attended, and there were very few people apart from the faithful Miss Sketchley and a few English people who recognised Dorothea. Her gravestone was paid for by an English couple who were fans of hers. Poor Dorothea. She, unlike many people of that time who fled abroad, did not incur any debts. She'd always acted responsibly and would have paid accreditors herself had she had the funds. <clears throat> William failed her after all the love and support she'd given him, emotional and financial. She should have spent her final days honoured, surrounded by her family and comforted in her illness. <clears throat> but she was driven from England and separated from her children. Her children were encouraged to forget her when she lived. <clears throat> William had cut her out of his life, and it's said he didn't even tell the children when she died. No one helped her get justice from the thief March, who repaid her support and affection <clears throat> in the most horrible way. We know you cannot die from a broken heart. Hearts don't break. But imagine Dorothea's situation, alone in a foreign country, impoverished through no fault of her own, no family, no support, no friends, you can think that her heart may well have broken. Dorothy and William's children all made very good marriages and the, answer, and the aristocracy is full of Dorothea's children. Here is a family tree and I have got some pictures. That's the eldest son, George, the Earl of Munster, Sophia, Baroness de Lisle, Henry, the next one, died when he was a little boy. Mary married Major General Charles Fox. Frederick is a Lieutenant General in the army. Um, Elizabeth is the Countess of Errol. Adolphus, a Rear Admiral. Augusta married twice. Augustus was a rector, I don't have a picture of her, him. Amelia, the youngest, Countess Falkland. She had three other children as well, Francis, Dorothea, and Lucy. I have got a picture of Francis, who, as I said, committed suicide in uh, 1826, thank goodness after her mother's death, so her mother didn't aware of it. And last but not least, you may recognize this gentleman descended from Dorothea through uh, Elizabeth. Now, finally, I wanted to give you a couple of books that you may enjoy. Uh, dealing with Dorothea and King William. Uh, and I hope very much that you enjoyed this talk. Thank you very much indeed. Oh,